The Enterprise NX-01 was the first ship in the NX class, which proved so important to Earth's history. These revolutionary vessels were humanity's first spaceships to be fitted with a Warp 5 engine that made interstellar exploration a practical reality. Enterprise NX-01 was rushed into service three weeks before she was ready, so that she could return Klang, a Klingon warrior who had crashed on Earth, to his people. As a result, she hadn't completed her shakedown cruise, but since the Klingon mission was deemed a success, Starfleet ordered the Enterprise to commence her mission. She was commanded by Captain Jonathan Archer throughout her ten years of active service. He had assembled the finest crew available to Starfleet, and they had all become legendary figures in the history of space exploration. The ship's chief engineer was Commander Charles Tripp Tucker III, a long-term friend of Archer's, who made major alterations to the Warp 5 engine during his ten years on board, and had had a profound influence on the design of all subsequent Starfleet vessels. The armory officer, Lieutenant Malcolm Reed, came from a naval family. During the mission, he helped Tucker make a significant improvement to the design of phase cannons and developed Starfleet's first effective force fields. The communications officer, Hoshi Sato, was a linguistic prodigy who grasped new languages with incredible speed and played a vital role in expanding the data set that the Universal Translator used. When NX-01 launched, her pilot and navigation officer, Travis Mayweather, had more experience of deep space than any other crew member, since he had been born and raised on a cargo freighter. The senior staff was rounded out by Dr. Flox, a noted research scientist from Denobula and Depol, a Vulcan who was originally assigned by the Vulcan High Command to advise the Enterprise human crew, although she subsequently left the High Command and joined Starfleet. The NX-01 rapidly earned her place in history. The plan was for her to go to Warp 5 shortly after leaving Earth's solar system, but in fact she eventually she wouldn't she wouldn't get this historic feat until February 2152. However, her regular cruising speed was in excess of Warp 4, which was sufficient to reach planets nearby star systems in just a few weeks rather than months or years as it had taken before. The crew found their first Minshara class planet, i.e. a planet suited, suitable to human life, or we would call it an M-class planet, three weeks after leaving Earth. She would go on to dozens of visit she would go on to visit dozens of inhabitable worlds, and Arch will go down in history as one of the greatest explorers of the twenty second century. Two planets and countless schools and other institutions on Earth will be named after him. The NX01 also played a significant role in Earth Vulcan relations. At this period in history, Vulcan and Andoria were on the verge of open war. Despite the Vulcans' public protestations of innocence, Archer exposed a Vulcan spy station in the ancient monastery at Pajem that was aimed at Andorian space. This earned Archer the trust of an Andorian captain named Shran. Over the following years, Archer was able to establish the Starfleet as an impartial intermediary between the Vulcans and the Andorians, and later between the Andorians and the Tellarites. This laid important groundwork for the creation of the United Federation of Planets. Archer's dealings with other civilizations were not all as successful. As had been mentioned, the NX-01 first mission to return the stranded Klingon warrior Klang to his home world, a gesture that proved significant in helping to prevent Earth's contentious relationship with the Klingon Empire from descending into open warfare. However, the ship's subsequent encounters with the Klingons were not particularly successful, and Archer was unable to establish good diplomatic relationships with them. Over the next century, the Klingons would become one of the greatest threats to the Federation. NX-01 was also involved in countering one of the most significant military threats of the 22nd century. In March 2153, the Zindi launched a devastating attack on Earth. A Zindi weapon entered Earth orbit and fired a force beam that cut at 4,000 kilometres long swathe from Florida to Venezuela, killing 7 million people. Earth soon learned that the weapon was only a prototype and that the Zindi were building a larger version that would destroy the planet. The Enterprise was recalled to Earth and fitted with additional weaponry before being sent to find the Zindi and to stop them. Archer discovered that the Zindi were being manipulated by creatures from a different dimension and according to some reports from a different time. He managed to persuade a fraction of the Zindi to side with him and prevent the weapon from being fired, saving Earth from destruction. This ensured that the Enterprise and X-01 and her crew would never be forgotten. In 2154, the NX-01 and Commander Topol in particular became involved in the overthrow of the Vulcan High Command, which had become increasingly aggressive and was supporting the Sirenite movement, which believed that Vulcan had moved away from the teachings of Sarak, a figure from Vulcan history who had persuaded them to abandon violence and dedicate themselves to logic. 
Captain Archer was instrumental in recovering Sarek's original writings, the Kishara, and proved that Velas, the leader of the Vulcan High Command, had fabricated evidence to justify a preemptive strike on Andoria. Velas was replaced by Kuvok, who dissolved the High Command and pursued a much more positive policy towards Earth. Despite the dangerous nature of space exploration, Archer and his senior staff almost all survived the ten years of their mission. The one significant exception was Commander Tucker, who was killed in 2161 on the ship's last mission, saving the Andorian Shram from a hostile boarding party. NX-01 returned to Earth in time for Captain Archer to sign the charter that founded the United Federation of Planets. Archer would later be promoted to Admiral and become Chief of Staff at Starfleet Academy. In 2164, he was made an honorary member of the Andorian Imperial Guard and served for five years as Federation Ambassador to Andoria. He would eventually become a member of the Federation Council, serving as its president for eight years from 2184 to 2192. However, despite all his later achievements, he would always be remembered as the first captain of the Starship Enterprise. In the second half of the 23rd century, Constitution-class starships were in the front line of Starfleet's mission to explore the galaxy. They were tasked with supporting newly established colonies and research missions, exploring new worlds and seeking out new life. They also patrolled the Federation's borders, ready to respond to hostile alien powers. All Constitution-class starships served with this distinction, but the Enterprise NCC-1701 became the most famous. The ship was launched from Earth's San Francisco shipyards in 2245 under the command of Captain Robert April. She was subsequently commanded for over a decade by Captain Christopher Pike, but earned her place in history after James T. Kirk assumed command in 2363. The following year, Kirk embarked on a five-year mission that is among the most significant in the Federation's history. Under Kirk, the Enterprise had one of the most impressive crews Starfleet had ever assembled, and Kirk himself became one of the most de decorated captains in Starfleet history. His science officer and second-in-command, Spock, was the only Vulcan serving on a human Starfleet vessel at the time. The half-human, half-Vulcan officer would help to integrate Vulcan more closely with its human partners in Starfleet and would ultimately become one of the Federation's greatest ambassadors, the, chief, the ship's chief medical officer, Dr. Leonard H. McCoy, is famous as the author of Comparative Alien Physiology, a seminal textbook that is primarily based on the material he gathered while serving on the Enterprise. The ship's chief engineer, Montgomery Scott, is a legend in engineering circles, and he virtually rewrote the book on starship, starship operations. During Kirk's first five-year mission, the Enterprise and her crew were involved in many historical important events. Among their numerous scientific discoveries, the crew probed beyond the edges of known space, developed a reliable method of time travel, and proved the existence of parallel universes. Shortly after Kirk assumed command, the Enterprise was the first starship to survive an encounter with a great energy barrier that just surrounds the galaxy. Crossing the barrier nearly destroyed the ship, and its effects on the crew showed just how dangerous an encounter with the barrier can be, since it enhanced latent psychic powers in two crew members. Lieutenant Gary Mitchell and Dr. Elizabeth Denier, giving them almost godlike powers and driving them mad. Even more significantly, the Enterprise was the first Federation vessel to document and prove the practicality of time travel. In 2267, following a serious infection that incapacitated the crew, the ship underwent an attempted cold restart of the warp engines using the new Intermix formula that was developed by Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott and Science Officer Spock. The resulting distortions and speed sent the Enterprise 71 hours back in time, proving beyond doubt that time travel was possible. A few months later, she was involved in an accident with a black hole that sent her much further back in time, the ship being sent to the year 1969. The crew was able to return to the 23rd century by taking advantage of the massive gravitational forces generated by warp engines and a slingshot manoeuvre around the sun. This established a workable method of time travel that was used by Starfleet for many years. In 2267, the Enterprise proved the existence of parallel universes when an iron storm caused a transport accident that sent the landing party to a mirror universe. The universe was very similar to our own, and yet different. Kirk's team managed to return by rep replicating the conditions that caused the accident. The Enterprise was also involved with some of the most important military and diplomatic incidents of the time. The late 23rd century was an extremely volatile period, and the Federation had hostile relations with the Romulans, the Klingons, and the Tholians. War was a constant danger, and the Enterprise was instrumental in avoiding at least two major conflicts. On Stardate 1709.2, she responded to a distress call from Federation outposts along the Romulan neutral zone. By the time the ship arrived, the outpost had been destroyed by a Romulan vessel using a cloaking device that made it almost impossible to detect. 
Kirk reasoned that the Romulans were testing the device and that if returned unharmed to Romulan space, the Federation's old enemy would certainly launch a full-scale war. The Enterprise therefore pursued the cloak vessel and, thanks to Kirk, tactical brilliance managed to destroy it. The cloaking technology gave the Romulans a major tactical edge over the Federation and two years later, in 2268, the Enterprise was involved in a covert operation to steal a cloaking device that involved Kirk pretending to suffer a nervous breakdown and allowing his ship to cross into the neutral zone. The danger of war with the Klingon Empire was even more acute. In 2267, peace negotiations between the Federation and the Klingons broke down, and the Enterprise was sent to a strategically important planet, Organia, to offer its inhabitants the Federation's protection. The Klingons also arrived on the planet, and the two powers were on the brink of all-out war, when the Organians, an apparently technologically retarded civilization, revealed themselves to be extremely involved and powerful beings who imposed a peace treaty that held for decades. The Enterprise completed her historic five-year mission in 2270, returned to the San Francisco shipyards and began, began a major refit that would see all of her systems significantly upgraded. Kirk accepted a promotion to Admiral and took up a position as head of Starfleet operations. Spock and McCoy both left Starfleet. Spock to pursue the study of perfect logic on Vulcan, and McCoy to enter private practice. The 18-month refit was carried out under the command of Captain William Decker. The refitted Enterprise 1701 was rushed back into service several months before the work was due to be completed in order to deal with the Vija crisis. Vija appeared to be a powerful energy cloud that was approaching Earth, destroying everything in its path, including the Federation's Epsilon 9 monitoring station and three Klingon battlecruisers. The Enterprise was the only Federation ship capable of, of intercepting it. Given his years of experience and the seriousness of the threat, Admiral Kirk assumed command, making Decker his executive officer. The refit Enterprise was far from ready to enter full service, but Kirk succeeded in intercepting the energy cloud and establishing that it was in fact a huge living machine and that had once been the, Voy the Earth probe Voyager 6. Vija had attained sentience and had returned to Earth in order to find its creator. Decker and the Enterprise navigation officer... Lieutenant Leah merged with the Voyager, allowing it to appreciate the full range of human experience. The living machine somehow gained a new understanding of reality and literally vanished, presumably leaving our universe to explore new and different forms of existence. Kirk now assumed permanent command of the, of the Reefer Enterprise, making her his flagship, and embarked on another five-year mission. When this was completed in 2277, he accepted a posting at Starfleet Academy, and the Reefer Enterprise became a training vessel under the command of the newly promoted Captain Scott. Spock, even. In 2285, Kirk took the ship, which was crewed by cadets from the Academy, to investigate a loss of communication with the Regular One Space Laboratory, which was working on the Genesis Project. This was an experimental terraforming device that was designed to transform uninhabitable planets into worlds capable of supporting life. Unfortunately, it had the side effect of destroying all existing life, making the Genesis device a powerful weapon. Kirk discovered that the device had fallen into the hands of the genetically engineered Khan Noonien Singh, and after a battle in deep space, the Genesis device was detonated in the Mutara Nebula, killing Khan and creating an entirely new planet. The Refit Enterprise was severely damaged during the encounter and Captain Spock was killed. Starfleet Command decided to retire the ship and reassign her crew. However, Kirk was determined to retrieve Spock's body from the Genesis planet and return it to Vulcan. Since the Genesis planet had been placed off limits, he and the senior staff stole the Refit Enterprise and made their way to the Genesis. When they arrived, they discovered the Klingons were already there and Kirk was forced to destroy the Enterprise to prevent her falling into their hands. Kirk and his crew eventually returned to Earth with the regenerated Spock, who had been miraculously restored to life by the Genesis process. In the course of their return to Earth, they saved Earth from an incredibly powerful alien vessel, and in recognition of this, Kirk was given command of another Constitution-class starship. He was, however, demoted to captain for his part in stealing the refit Enterprise to direct controversy in direct contravention of his orders. Kirk's new ship was the USS Yorktown, which had recently undergone a substantial refit. In order of her predecessor, she was recommissioned as the Enterprise NCC-1701A. The use of a suffix in the ship's registry is a rare honour that is only granted to Starfleet's most distinguished vessels. It's a privilege that the Enterprise would retain, with the next four vessels of this all using the NCC-1701 registry, even though they belong to different classes of starship. The new Enterprise A completed her shakedown cruise in 2287 and began another deep space mission under Kirk's command. She was finally retired in 2293 after being involved in historic negotiations with the Klingons at the Kitamir Peace Conference.
Appropriately, the Enterprise A was instrumental in destroying a cloaked Klingon vessel commanded by the Klingon General Chang, who was intent on disrupting the peace process. Kirk and Spock also exposed Starfleet officers who were equally determined to avoid peace with the Klingons. She was eventually left in a Starfleet museum. Work on the Enterprise NCC 1701B began in 2288 as part of Starfleet's project to replace the aging Constitution class ships with larger and faster vessels. The project began in the early 2280s, but it was delayed by several years after difficulties with Starfleet's new transwarp engine design. The Excelsior, the first ship in the class, initially entered service in 2284 when she was used as the test bed for the experimental transwarp drive. However, despite early promise, this technology proved unreliable and was abandoned in 2287. This necessitated a complete replacement of the engine system with more conventional technology, and Excelsior finally entered full service in 2290, four years behind schedule. The Enterprise B followed three years later and was formally commissioned in three months after her predecessor, the Enterprise A, was retired. Her construction was supervised by Captain John Harriman, who had limited experience of active space exploration. Since the previous Enterprise had been so celebrated, there was considerable interest in the launch of the new ship, and Captain James D. Kirk and several members of the senior staff attended the event. The plan was to make a brief journey to Pluto and back, but during the ceremony the ship detected two Elorian vessels in serious distress after they were caught in an energy room known as the Nexus. The Enterprise B responded and succeeded in rescuing one of the ships and 47 crew members from the other vessel but Captain Kirk was lost during the mission while making the modifications to the ship's deflector dish that allowed her to escape from the ribbon. The Enterprise B was badly damaged during the mission and only left space dock several months later, this time under Captain William George. His senior staff included Chief Engineer Michael Jennings, Chief Medical Officer Dr Kate Giles and Science Officer Naran Kaur. During Captain George's command, the ship was instrumental in exploring the area of space beyond the Gurami sector, during which time she mapped 142 star systems and made first contact with 17 civilizations. Following two tours of deep space exploration, the Enterprise D was assigned to Federation space, where part of her duties involved patrolling the border of the Romulan neutral zone. The 2290s had seen some diplomatic, diplomatic progress between the Federation and the Romulan Empire. For example, both parties were involved in productive talks at the Kitama Conference and at the negotiations that followed. However, in the early years of the 24th century, tensions between the two powers began to grow, and the Enterprise B was involved in standoffs with Romulan warships on a number of occasions. <clears throat> Events culminated in their disastrous tombed incident, in which Starfleet responded to a Romulan attack that cost thousands of Federation lives, were fitting several of its ships, including the Enterprise B, with cloaking devices and sending them into the Romulan neutral zone. The potential conflict caused a split in the Romulan Senate that was only resolved when an isolationist faction assumed power and agreed to begin peace negotiations with the Federation. The Enterprise B transported several Federation ambassadors, including the Vulcan Sarek, to the planet Algeron, where a new treaty was signed that re-established the neutral zone and prohi prohibited the Federation from using cloaking devices. Following the tombed incident, the Enterprise B's first officer, Demora Sulu, who had joined the ship as helm officer straight from Starfleet Academy, was promoted to captain. During the following years, she commanded the ship on a variety of voyages, including a two-year mission to chart the archaeological remains of the proto-Vulcan Debrun civilization in the Baradus system. In the 2320s, Enterprise B was reassigned to newly established border with Cardassian space, now under the command of Captain Thomas John Johnson Sr. The Enterprise D B, sorry, was again involved in a very tense situation as the two powers came close to all-out conflict. When the Cardassian Union annexed the planet Bajor in 2328, Enterprise B offered assistance to a number of Bajoran refugee ships, but Starfleet was unwilling to enter in full, into a full-scale conflict and the Enterprise's role was restricted to relocating Bajorans to nearby planets in Federation space. The Enterprise B was lost, presumed destroyed in 2329, the last report Starfleet received indicated that the crew had contracted a dangerous infection, but exactly what happened after the ship's final transmission is unknown. The Enterprise NCC-1701C was the third Ambassador-class vessel to be built and was commissioned in 2332 at Earth Station McKinley. Command was given to 33-year-old Captain Rachel Garrett, who was promoted after an impressive tour of duty as the first officer of the USS Hood. The 2330s were a tense period. Although the Federation had been in peace negotiations with the Klingons since the 2290s, relationships between the two powers were often strained. 
From 2341 onwards, Enterprise C was assigned to an area of space that bordered both the Klingon and Romulan empires. The Federation had had no direct contact with the Romulans since the Tomed incident of 2311, when thousands of lives were lost. However, Starfleet was aware that the Romulans and Klingons were at odds, and the Romulans mounted assaults on Klingon colonies throughout the 2340s. In 2344, the Enterprise C was on course with the planet Archer 4, when she responded to responded to a distress call from a Klingon outpost on Naranda 3. When she arrived, Captain Garrett discovered that the small Klingon settlement was facing four Romulan warbirds and had no chance of survival. She attacked the Romulans, even though her ship was heavily outgunned. During the battle, the Enterprise C took more than 400 casualties and lost her entire senior staff, apart from Captain Garrett. At the decisive moment in the battle, a photon torpedo created a rift in space-time, and the Enterprise C was thrown 22 years into the future. In the future that the Enterprise C visited, the Federation was at war with the Klingon Empire, following the breakdown of peace negotiations in the 2350s. Garrett's Enterprise encountered her immediate successor, the Galaxy-class Enterprise 1701D, under the command of Captain John Luke Picard. He decided that the Enterprise C's departure from the timeline might well have had serious consequences and persuaded Captain Garrett to return to her own time, even though she and her crew were facing certain death. While the Enterprise C was in the future, she was repaired and made battle-ready. Unfortunately, she was also attacked by the Klingons and Captain Garrett was killed, leaving Lieutenant Richard Costello to take command. He was assisted by Lieutenant Tashi Yar, a member of the Enterprise D crew, who decided to join him on the Enterprise C. When Castillo returned to Naranda 3, only seconds had passed in normal time, and the ship was able to inflict serious damage on the Romulans, destroying one of the warbirds before she was eventually overpowered. The surviving 36 members of the crew, including Tashi Yar, were taken prisoner by the Romulans and transported to the Romulan homeworld. The Federation only learned of their capture in 2368. However, the Enterprise C's sacrifice did not go unnoticed. The Klingons detected the remains of a destroyed warbird and identified the weapon signature as belonging to a Starfleet ship. They greatly admired the sacrifice of the Enterprise and regarded Captain, Ar- Captain Garrett's willingness to enter a battle she stood little chance of winning as both honourable and glorious. More importantly, they saw it as proof that the Federation could be a worthy ally. The heroic actions of Captain Garrett and her crew also ensured that the future they had visited never came to pass. Instead, the Federation and the Klingon Empire became allies, allies ushering in a much more peaceful period of history. The USS Enterprise NCC-1701D was Starfleet's flagship and was in operation for just eight years before her untimely destruction in 2371. During that time, her crew made first contact with 27 species, made countless scientific and cultural discoveries, engaged in several important diplomatic missions that prevented catastrophic wars, saved Earth and much of the Federation for Borg assimilation, and was nearly destroyed more than once. The Enterprise D was home to more than 1,000 crew members. When she was launched in 2364, her senior crew compromised Captain Jean-Luc Picard, Commander William T. Riker as his first officer. Commander Beverly Crusher as Chief Medical Officer, Lieutenant Commander Data as Operations Officer, Lieutenant Commander Sarah McDougall as Chief Engineer, Lieutenant Commander Deanna Troy as Ship's Counselor, Lieutenant Natasha Yar as Tactical Officer and as Security Chief, and Lieutenant Junior Grade Geordie LaForge as the Con Officer. Other notable, so- notable crew members were Le- Lieutenant Junior Grade Wolf, initially also Con Officer Edson Wesley Crusher and Chief Miles O'Brien as the Transporter Chief. Worf's assignment to the crew was particularly noticeable, as he was the first Klingon to serve in Starfleet. He was promoted to Lieutenant and became Tactical Officer following the death of Tashi Yar in late 2364. In the first year of operation, the Enterprise D had several Chief Engineers. The first was Lieutenant Commander Sarah McDougall, followed by Lieutenant Commander Argyll, Lieutenant Logan and Lieutenant Commander Leyland T. Lynch before Geordie LaForge was promoted to full lieutenant and took on the role in 2365, a position he then held for the rest of the Enterprise D operational life. Other notable changes to the crew included Commander Catherine Polsky, Polowski, taking over as Chief Medical Officer in 2365 for approximately a year, in the additional of Ensign Ro Lauren as Con Officer in 2368 to 2370. During the Enterprise D's very first mission, she made a first of, of what would be several memorable encounters with Q, an omnipotent, omnipotent, oh God, omnipotent, omnipotent, and obnoxious entity. Q put humanity on trial, accusing them of being a dangerous, savage child race, and threatened them with execution unless they could prove otherwise. 
Fortunately, Q agreed that humanity had some redeeming qualities and the potential to improve after the crew saved an enslaved and dying space-born entity that had been forced by the Bandy to take on the former Firepoint Station. Also during the course of the mission, the Enterprise D performed the first ever high warp, so high warp speed saucer separation. The Enterprise D first made contact with several more space-born life forms during the missions, including Nagalum, an extremely powerful extra-dimensional creature that lived in a hole in space, Gomtu, a living spaceship, the crystalline entity, a massive creature that resembled a snowflake and stripped planets of all organic life in order to sustain itself, <clears throat> and Jumia, a creature that fed directly off the Enterprise power after its mother had accidentally been killed. Other unusual life forms discovered by the Enterprise D included microbrains, silicon based life forms that resemble tiny sparkling crystals and refer to humans as ugly bags of mostly water. Margin 7 beans, subspace life forms that resembled small chemical flames, and selenogen based entities that existed in the deep subspace domain and abducted Enterprise crew members in their sleep to perform medical experiments of their own. The Enterprise D even helped to create some new sentient life forms in the shape of nanites. Sub microscopic robots that started off as part of an experiment by Wesley Crusher before becoming self aware. Exocomps, engineering the tools with artificial intelligence, also came to be regarded as sentient life forms while aboard the Enterprise D when they demonstrated the instinct for self preservation. A holodeck program that recreated the fictional character Moriarty was so sophisticated that it too was considered a sentient life form. Finally, the Enterprise D herself became an emergent life form when the computer systems linked together, forming a neural network akin to a brain. The emergent life form manifested itself through existing characters in the holodeck, and as it became more complex, it created semi organic life forms that eventually left the ship to live in space. As well as encountering new life forms, the Enterprise D explored new areas of space, thanks to a mysterious alien known as the Traveller, who had the ability to alter space and time merely with his thoughts. The Enterprise was hurled 2,700,000 light years to the distant M33 galaxy. In trying to return her, the Traveller sent the ship to a billion light years in the other direction before collapsing with the exhaustion. Only when the Traveller had recovered did he manage to return the Enterprise to our home galaxy. In 2367, the Enterprise was sent by Q to another area of space that no Starfleet vessel had been to before, the Delta Quadrant. Here she had her first encounter with the Borg, an immensely powerful society of cybernetic humanoids with one collective mind, who sought perfection by relentlessly conquering worlds and assimilating their technology. During this encounter, the crew learned that the Borg could not be reasoned or bargained with, and they heard for the first time the Borg's chilling mantra, Resistance is futile. It soon became apparent that the Enterprise D's tactical abilities were no match for those of the Borg cube-shaped ship. The Enterprise was held in the Borg Cube's tractor beam while cut and beam sliced sections 27, 28 and 29 on decks 4, 5 and 6, killing 18 crew members in the process. Only the intervention of Q, who sent the Enterprise back to Federation of Space, saved the ship from certain destruction at the hands of the Borg, but Captain Picard felt that they had not seen the last of them, and he was right. The following year, a Borg Cube invaded Federation Space, destroying it all before it as it headed straight for Earth. Picard was captured and assimilated meaning that everything he knew about the Starfleet defences, the Borg now knew. Commander Riker took over as captain of the Enterprise-D, which became part of a 40-strong armada of Starfleet ships assembled at War 359, hoping to stop the Borg. Every ship except the Enterprise-D was destroyed in the confrontation with the loss of over 11,000 lives. The Enterprise herself was badly damaged. Her deflector dish and warp core were also overloaded as several decks were flooded with radiation, but the Borg Cube was finally defeated when a computer command was successfully downloaded into the Borg Collective, ultimately causing its destruction. In the aftermath of the battle with the Borg, the Enterprise-D required a full refit at Earth Station McKinley, which took six weeks. During the refit, the opportunity was taken to give her a phaser upgrade and a new dilithium chamber hatch, which later proved to be defective. This caused an explosion in the warp drive system, which crippled the ship for two weeks. For a vessel whose primary mission was to peacefully explore the galaxy, the Enterprise-D had a surprising number of encounters that almost led to her destruction. In 2368, she struck a quantum filament, a type of spatial anomaly, which caused widespread damage to the, shifts, the ship systems, and several crew members were killed when they became trapped after emergency bulkheads closed. In addition, the ships almost lost antimatter containment, which would have resulted in its destruction but the crew managed to restore power before this happened. Later the same year, the Enterprise-D was destroyed in a collision with the USS Bozeman, over and over again, 
after she became trapped in a temporal causality loop. Fortunately, feelings of deja vu among the crew allowed them to piece together the fact that they were living the same period of time again and again, and they were able to send a message into the next loop and thereby avoid the, coll- uh, thereby avoid the collision. In 2369, the Enterprise D was nearly destroyed in an explosion caused by a feedback loop when transferred transferring energy to a Roman and Warbird, whose artificial quantum sinking narrowly warp core had failed. The destruction of both ships was avoided after it was discovered that life forms from another space time continuum had colonised the artificial quantum singularity and fired on the Enterprise to protect themselves. When the ship wasn't being nearly destroyed or discovering new life forms, it was at the heart of political power struggles in the Alpha Quadrant. In 2368, the Enterprise played a central role in coordinating the Tachyon detection grid that prevented cloaked Romulan ships from crossing the Klingon border and delivering supplies to the House of Duras during the Klingon Civil War. If the Romulans had been successful in helping Duras become the leader of the Klingon Empire, it would have led to a massive shift in the power balance of the Alpha Quadrant, and almost certainly to war with the Federation. In 2369, Captain Picard was sent on a clandestine mission to search for a Cardassian weapons research facility on Celsius III. While Picard was absent, Captain Edward Jellicoe took command of the Enterprise-D and prevented a Cardassian strike near the Macahalostar C-5 Nebula, while also securing the release of Picard, who had been captured by the Cardassians. The Enterprise-D was also instrumental in many scientific and cultural discoveries, the most important occurring in 2369 when evidence was unearthed that the Milky Way had been seeded by an ancient humanoid species. This proved that many species, including humans, Klingons, Romulans and Cardassians, shared a common ancestor. In 2370, the Enterprise-D became one of the first Federation ships to successfully use a cloaking device. The technology had been developed in violation of the Treaty of Algorum 12 years earlier and used aboard the USS Pegasus, before the ship had been lost, lost in an asteroid field. <coughs> the Enterprise-D was forced to use the interphasic cloaking device during its recovery after she became trapped inside a huge asteroid. <coughs> the technology not only made the Enterprise-D invisible, but also allowed her to travel through solid matter as a molecular phase inverter moved the ship out of phase of the space-time continuum. <clears throat> For all the excitement and danger the Enterprise D went through, most days were far more routine. In fact, Commander, Le- uh, Commander Data was on average aboard the ship. This included four birthdays, two personal transfers, two chess tournaments, a secondary school play, four promotions, the celebration of the Hindu Festival of Lights and a birth and a wedding. Unfortunately for the Enterprise D, another day this time in 2371 proved far more far from routine. While trying to save the Viridian system, the Enterprise was attacked by a Klingon bird of prey, commanded by the Duras sisters. They modulated their weapons to the same frequency as the Enterprise shields, destroying the uh, redeeming them useless. Although the Enterprise D destroyed the Klingon ship in an ensuing battle, they, she suffered heavy damage to her in the engineering hull, promoting prompting an emergency source of separation. The warp core breached moments later, blowing the star drive section to pieces, and the resultant shockwave hit the saucer section, knocking out its primary systems, including propulsion. Caught in the gravity of Viridian 3, the saucer section crash landed on the planet's surface, and although there were no fatalities, it was beyond damaged. Surveying the wreckage later, Riker expressed his dismay over the fate of the ship that was once the pride of the fleet, but Picard voiced his opinion that he doubted it would be the last vessel to carry the name Enterprise. He was right. Following the loss of the Galaxy Class Enterprise or NCC 1701D in 2371, Starfleet opted to make the next Enterprise a Sovereign Class ship and gave the name to a vessel that was already nearing completion. The senior staff of the Enterprise D under Captain John Luke Picard were assigned to the new ship, which was still under construction at the San Francisco Yards orbiting Earth. The Enterprise E was launched in 2372. Like the Enterprise D, she was made Starfleet's flagship. Picard and his crew were among the most admired in the fleet. But at this point, Picard himself had turned down several opportunities to be promoted to Admiral, feeling that he was best suited to command on his ship and that was an active service. His first officer, Commander Royka, had also passed up command to his own in order to continue serving on the Enterprise. The rest of the senior staff consisted of Chief Medical Doctor Beverly Crusher, Chief Engineer Jordi LaForge and Science Officer Data, all of whom had served on the Enterprise D. They were joined by a new con officer, Lieutenant Hawk. The only member of the senior staff who didn't transfer to the new Enterprise was the Klingon Commander Worf, who accepted a promotion and a new posting to Deep Space Nine, where his knowledge of Klingon culture proved invaluable. He later returned to service aboard the Enterprise-E after spending some time as a Federation ambassador to the Klingon Empire. The Enterprise-E started her career with a one-year shakedown cruise in which all of her major systems were tested. 
In 2373, her mission was interrupted by the Second Borg invasion. Initially, Starfleet was concerned that Picard would be vulnerable because he had been assimilated by the Borg in 2366, effectively becoming a member of this cybernetic species. So they ordered the Enterprise to patrol the Romulan neutral zone. However, once the battle began, Picard and his crew disobeyed orders and joined the fleet that was engaged the Borg cube near Earth. The Enterprise E arrived at a pivotal moment. Admiral Hay's ship had just been destroyed and the battle was in balance. Picard assumed command of the, of the fleet and using knowledge he had gained during his assimilation managed to destroy the Borg cube. However, a group of Borg managed to escape and travelled into Earth's past where they tried to prevent Zephram Cochrane's historic first flight and the ensuing first contact with the Vulcans. Enterprise pursued them and succeeded in protecting the timeline before returning to the present. During a mission, the Enterprise E was partially assimilated by the Borg and had to spend several weeks in space dock before returning to active duty. She then went on to the Cardassian Front during the Dominion War and was involved in several distinguished missions. In 2375, following the conclusion of the war, the Enterprise E was involved in exposing a plot to relocate the Baku from their planet, where the atmosphere had incredible medical medicinal qualities. In 2379, Starfleet sent the Enterprise E to Romulus, to negotiate with the new Romulan praetor, Shinzon, the leader of the Riemann faction who had seized power. The Enterprise crew discovered that Shinzon was actually a clone of Captain Picard, who had been created by an earlier Romulan regime as part of a plan to infiltrate the Federation. Changes in the Romulan Senate had resulted in this being abandoned and Shinzon had been sent to the Riemann mines where he had grown up. As an adult, he had organised a coup and made himself praetor of the Romulan Empire. He claimed that he wanted peace with the Federation, but Picard soon realised that this was a ruse and that he planned to use a new weapon ship, the Scimitar, to destroy Earth. The Enterprise E engaged the Scimitar in the Basin Rift and with assist assistance from two Romulan warbirds, whose crews had rebelled against Shinzon, managed to defeat him. Picard only achieved this by ramming the Scimitar, causing significant damage to the Enterprise. Commander Data was also killed during this mission when he disabled the Riemann weapon. The Enterprise E returned to Space Dock, where she was repaired and upgraded. The newly promoted Captain Riker took up his new posting on the USS Titan, where he was joined by Councillor Troy. He was replaced as Captain's first officer by Commandant Martin Madden. Following a refit, the Enterprise E was scheduled to begin a deep space exploration mission to the DNAB system, with mission goals that were almost identical to her illustrious predecessor, the Enterprise NX-01. The name Enterprise has been consistent throughout Earth's history. The French, English and American navies all had them, from early sloops and schooners to the world's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. The name was, however, to become most famous because of the various starships that carried it. The first Enterprise designed for space travel was NASA's prototype space shuttle OV-101. She was unveiled in September 1976 and undertook vital tests, including unpowered landings and stress testing. However, because she was a prototype, the Enterprise never left Earth's atmosphere. The honour of being the first Enterprise in space would go to the NX-class Enterprise NX-01, which launched in 2151 under the command of Commander Cap of Captain Jonathan Archer. This ship was one of the most important vessels in Earth's history, since she was the first starship to be fitted with a warp fire engine. Early Earth ships were capable of only of speeds in the region of warp 2. At this speed, a journey between ne nearby stars could, would still take several years. At Warp 5, those same journeys would only take a few weeks, so the development of the Warp 5 engine was a huge priority. The Vulcans felt that humanity was not ready to enter the fray of the galactic politics and refused to share their superior warp engine designs, so mankind had to develop the technology without their assistance. Zephram Cochran, the inventor of the warp engine, broke ground at the Warp 5 research complex in 2129, some 66 years after his first historic flight. The most significant work on the Warp 5 engine was done by Henry Archer. His son Jonathan, a noted test pilot who had been the first man to break the Warp 2 barrier, was assigned as Enterprise's NX-01's captain. The ship remained under his command throughout her operational lifespan, and her crew made first contact with dozens of intelligent species, and famously laid the groundwork for the foundation of the United Federation of Planets in 2161. Miraculously, she survived her mission intact and became a museum ship. The next Starship Enterprise was a Constitution-class vessel that was launched in 2245 under the command of Captain Robert April, who completed a five-year mission of deep space exploration. 
This enterprise was then commanded by two of Starfleet's best-known captains. Christopher Pike assumed command in 2250 and completed two five-year missions that are among the most famous in Federation history. During his command, Pike was joined by the first Vulcan to serve in Starfleet since the foundation of the Federation. The half-human, half-Vulcan Spock was originally the ship's science officer. He would later go on to captain the ship and become one of the Federation's greatest ambassadors. At the end of Pike's first mission, the ship underwent a major refit that saw the crew complement increase from 203 to 430. After 11 years in command, Pike was promoted to fleet captain and command pastor James T. Kirk, who became one of the most admired captains in Starfleet history. Kirk's initial five-year mission as required reading at Starfleet Academy and was so successful that he was promoted to Admiral when he completed it in 2269. This enterprise then underwent eight, another 18-month refit. This was an extensive rebuild and was supervised by the Enterprise's legendary Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott under the command of Captain William Decker. When the incredibly powerful entity known as Vija approached Earth in 2271, destroying everything in its path, the newly refitted Enterprise was rushed into service with Admiral Kirk assuming temporary command. The mission was a success, but Captain Decker was lost when he merged with Vija, evolving to a new life form of saving Earth. In 2277, Starfleet recognised Enterprise's unique contribution to history by abolishing the separate emblems that had been used on different Starfleet ships and starbases, and replacing them with the Enterprise's arrowhead badge. By 2284, Enterprise had been assigned to Starfleet Academy under the command of Captain Spock as a training vessel. The following year, she responded to a signal from the space station Regular One, where Dr. Carol Marcus was developing the Genesis device. This was a terraforming technology that could completely restructure a planet's environment, making a lifeless world habitable. Unfortunately, Genesis had the side effect of destroying any life that had existed on the planet before it was deployed. When the Enterprise responded to the signal, Spock passed command to Admiral Kirk, who was on board, arguing that it was only logical. During the mission, the Genesis device fell into the hands of Carl Noonien Singh, a genetically engineered madman from Earth's past. Kirk prevented him from using Genesis, instead detonating it in a Mutura Nebula, where it created a new planet. Unfortunately, Captain Spock was killed during a mission, and his body was laid to rest on the new Genesis planet. Kirk returned the badly damaged Enterprise to space dock, where Starfleet decided that the damage was so severe that the ship should be retired. However, when Kirk learned that Vulcan tradition required him to return Spock's body to Vulcan, he and several members of his senior staff disobeyed direct orders, stole the Enterprise and returned to Genesis. When they arrived, Kirk was forced to destroy the Enterprise to prevent Klingons taking control of her. Incredibly, the Genesis effect had regenerated Spock's body, and the Priestess Talara used the ancient Fulton Pardon ceremony to rejoin it with his Katra on Mount Selenia on Vulcan. In 2286, Kirk and his crew returned to Earth to face court martial. But when they arrived, the planet was under attack by an alien probe and they were instrumental in saving it. In recognition of their extraordinary service, Starfleet assigned them to another Constitution class, the USS Yorktown, which was renamed the Enterprise 1701A in honour of her predecessor. Kirk was demoted to captain for disobeying orders, and assumed command of the ship for the rest of her service until she was retired in 2293. A new Excelsior class Enterprise with the registry number NCC-1701B was launched the same year. Kirk attended the dedication ceremony, but was lost presumed killed when the Enterprise rescued two Elorian vessels from an energy disturbance. The Enterprise served with distinction, her crew boldly exploring the unknown area of space beyond the Gurami sector, and she was one of several vessels involved in the tuned incident, which led to the re-establishment of the Romulan neutral zone in 2311. She was finally lost in action in 2329. Her fate is uncertain, but it is assumed that the crew contracted a plague. The next Enterprise was an Ambassador-class ship that was launched in 2232, under the command of Captain Rachel Garrett. This ship was destroyed in 2344, defending a Klingon outpost at Narenda III from the Romulan attack. The loss of the Enterprise 1701C plays a vital role in establishing peace between the Federation and the Klingon Empire. Since the Klingons greatly admired the crew's willingness to sacrifice their ship in face of some insurmountable odds in an effort to save a small number of Klingons. 
Starfleet took the, si the decision to reserve the name Enterprise for one of the Galaxy-class ships, which was then in development at the Utopia Planitia shipyards above Mars. Work on the Enterprise D, the third Galaxy-class ship, began at 2350. The new Enterprise wouldn't launch until 2363, but she was made Starfleet's flagship and placed under the command of veteran Captain Jean-Luc Picard, one of the most admired officers in Starfleet. The new Enterprise was a significant departure from her predecessors, since she had a crew of over a thousand, which included a large civilian population and their families. The Enterprise D lived up to her famous name and was instrumental in saving the entire Alpha Quadrant from the Borg invasion in 2366, as well as playing a vital role in the Klingon Civil War 2368. She was destroyed in 2371, when a renegade Klingon faction attacked her, causing a warp core to overload. The crew survived, after separating the saucer section and landing on the planet Viridian III. Starfleet immediately commissioned a new Enterprise, the Sovereign Class USS Enterprise NCC-1701E, again under the command of Captain Picard. He was joined by a significant proportion of his original crew, including all the senior staff. This Enterprise was involved in saving Earth from attempted invasions by the Borg and Romulans. In 2379, she was due to explore the Dunarp system, following in the footsteps of her distinguished procession predecessors.